So thank you very much to everyone for coming along today to join this session on the missing goal. Uh, this is a session that's organised by the Culture 2030 Goal campaign, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But crucially, it's a campaign, it's an effort that focuses on the potential and the potential we are potentially missing right now to make more, to integrate culture more effectively into work across the board to deliver on the sustainable development goals. The campaign is built very strongly on the sense that in 2015, we missed an opportunity. There was the possibility to have a goal on culture, to elevate culture, to set out cultures having the same role, the same importance as other key areas of policy, um, which would have triggered hopefully more integration of it, which would have triggered a greater consideration of culture as an enabler, as a facilitator of development, as well as of course being a goal in itself. So what we try to do as the campaign, bringing together a range of international networks focused on culture, including the United Cities and Local Governments Culture Committee, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, the International Music Council, the International Federation of Library Association, Associations and Institutions, Arterial Network, Cultural Action Europe, and the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity. Together, we look to correct this mistake, to ensure, to highlight good practice, to highlight the value of not only thinking about how we can ensure there is a goal in any future agenda, but also how can we act as if there is a goal today? Um, the campaign carries out a number of pieces of work. We carry out analyses of the presence of culture in voluntary national reviews and voluntary local reviews. And already on the basis of some initial analysis that we're seeing today, if the voluntary national reviews that have been published, we already have about a third setting our culture as a pillar of sustainable development. We have a half more broadly stating how culture enables wider progress against the goals, as well as quite a lot of examples of how it's citing culture as being a driver of growth, a driver of employment, a way of supporting identity and social cohesion, a way of supporting education. However, this remains deeply unequal, deeply unbalanced for the moment, so there's definitely scope to go further. So what we're going to do in the session today is firstly share a couple of really key outputs that have been put together by the campaign and by those involved in the campaign, which hopefully support in this broader effort. And um, we will hear from John Crowley, who is um, who we'll we'll hear from John Crowley, who is a um, who has previously worked extensively on foresight issues as the head of the foresight team at UNESCO. And now who actually runs his own, uh, runs a consultancy focusing on questions around renewable energy and environmental consulting. And he'll talk about the work that he carried out for the campaign, looking at the history of goal, of a culture goal, but also developing the idea of what a culture goal might look like, a zero draft that the campaign was able to publish in time for the Mondi Cult Conference organised by UNESCO in September of last year. We'll hear from Jordi Pasquale, who is the coordinator of the Culture Committee at the United Cities and Local Government. He's a geographer and cultural manager and has been extremely heavily involved in different aspects of the cultural world, of cultural policy for many years, and will bring in some really valuable insights on what the interconnections between a culture goal and the rest of the sustainable development agenda could look like. We'll hear from Brittany Colville, who we, uh, so we'll hear from Brittany Colville, who is the head of archaeological conservation at the University of Canberra, but also a very active member of the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group at the uh, International, International Council on Monuments and Sites, which has done some fantastic work to mobilise the heritage community, and, will, and she will be offering her perspectives about what a culture goal would mean within that sector, what efforts it could mobilise, what energies it could mobilise. And finally, then we'll hear from Jorge Del Docado. Who is a um, who is a professor of information? Who is a professor of information science? Teaches about it live in information science at the University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, and who is the president of the Federation of Brazilian Library Associations, and he will offer the perspective from library side of what a goal could mean there. So, with that, um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to John in order to talk about the genesis, you know, why we are where we are, and what as a what a culture goal in the future might look like. So over to you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm not sure uh, exactly who's online, of course, though I saw a, a list earlier as you were connecting, but there may be more people now. Great pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you. 
Um, Stephen gave the introduction very concisely, so I won't repeat it. Um, what I would like to do um, is draw attention to expound briefly, comment on and study the implications of a document that was produced, um, as Stephen indicated, by the Culture 2030 Goal campaign in September 2022, uh, published at the time of the Mondia Cult uh, meeting in Mexico City, called A Culture Goal is Essential for Our Common Future, uh, which tries to explain, first of all, why culture is missing from the sustainable development framework. I won't say a lot about that. Stephen's already mentioned it. Uh, secondly, why this matters. And third, how in semi-technical terms, not going all the way to the details of indicators, for instance, uh, this could be remedied. I don't know if um, someone could perhaps uh, be kind enough to put the URL to access the document in the chat of this meeting so that those of you who haven't seen it can uh, download it. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen. So that those of you who haven't seen it can uh, download it and uh, have a more detailed uh, understanding of what we were talking about than is possible in 15 minutes now. So first of all, why? Why does all of this matter? And I think there's a very simple take home message. Um, if the sustainable development framework had been in 2015 a limited number of targeted, prioritized development goals for the international community, then maybe the exclusion of culture might have been a reasonable choice, maybe. But of course, that's precisely not what the sustainable development goals were. It's not what the 2030 agenda was. The 2030 agenda and its um, associated goals, targets, and indicators were intended to be have been set up as a comprehensive, cross-cutting, all-encompassing framework for development, covering all aspects of what matters to achieve um, the fundamental um, goals or principles of inclusion and sustainability. That's why the absence of culture is a problem. And more specifically, why could the absence of culture or should the absence of culture be addressed not through better inclusion of culture in the sustainable development goals as they are? As you probably know, there are a number of specific references to uh, culture issues, including with some indicators in certain goals dealing with other things, such as education, for instance, or cities. And there are allusions uh, or references to culture in a rather less detailed fashion in other parts of the agenda. Culture isn't completely missing, but it is present in a fragmentary way, not covering the whole scope of what matters with respect to culture, and not ensuring the kind of integrated perspective that has been adopted for other things like oceans or biodiversity or cities or education. The document, I'll start with the conclusions, um, states five reasons why a dedicated culture goal uh, would be valuable. Possible, we'll discuss in a moment. Possible depends on how you set it up, and the zero draft is important for that. But valuable, and indeed perhaps decisive for the ability of uh, the sustainable development goals to uh, live up to their billing and actually change the world in a positive way. First of all, a culture goal is important to ensure adequate focus on culture at the highest level of government. To put it very simply, to put it as a slogan, culture is too important to be left to culture ministries. The same is true of every aspect of the sustainable development agenda, the whole point of which is integration. Not mainstreaming, which tends to mean the opposite of integration in practice, but fully taking account of um, culture, just as one needs to fully take account of climate change, gender equality, and all the other aspects of the agenda. Secondly, to ensure that the range of connections between culture and other policy areas are fully accounted for. Again, a challenge of integration. Culture doesn't connect to just one aspect of the sustainable development agenda. There are connections between culture and climate change, culture and cities, culture and education, culture and poverty eradication, culture 
and uh, gender equality. And they're not always the same aspects of culture that intervene in each of these connections. So there's a multi-dimensional space of culture and culture policies to be shaped and structured. Everyone active in the cultural area knows this. And at the same time, that multi-dimensional web of interconnections within the cultural space leads to a whole series of interfaces, rather complex topology, if you like, mathematical metaphors with other aspects of the sustainable development you done. You can't reduce it to just a limited set of interactions or intersections as the current sustainable development agenda does. Third, to ensure that the culture sector itself feels a sense of engagement in and ownership of the goals. The document published in 2022 was based, among other things, on a survey of uh, stakeholders in the culture sector. And what was striking in the outcome of that survey was the level, the very broad level of support for the principle of a culture goal, precisely as creating a framework for engagement, engagement in culture as a um, driver of sustainable development, a phrase that is well recognized within the international community, but not given sufficient institutional and practical uh, substance. Fourth, to ensure that all other goals are activated and that their achievement is strengthened through the mobilizing power of culture. I've already referred to this in commenting on the second point. The idea is that culture matters way beyond culture. In my area of expertise, the uh, interface between culture and climate resilience, for instance, is absolutely essential to coherent climate action. It's also essential to issues about cultural resilience and cultural survival, including in particular the cultural survival of indigenous peoples. And this is just one connection that happens to be at the heart of some of my other work. And you could go through all 16 or even 17 of the goals, including the more uh, procedure oriented goal 17, and identify the multiple ways in which culture is both the framework against which the backdrop um, against which the challenges arise and the framework within which solutions must be imagined and implemented. And fifth and finally, to ensure that the achievement of all goals can be protected from systemic and behavioral barriers that can be addressed through a cultural lens. Culture matters not just for culture, but very practically for all of the objectives that the international community has already set for itself in 2015. So the absence of culture is unfortunate, but also structurally significant in terms of the ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, you might ask, um, are we talking about a long-term goal here? Are we talking about post-2030? In a purely formal sense, yes, because there's no current uh, framework for rewriting the SDGs before their expiry in 2030. But first of all, it's been made pretty clear, including by the Secretary General of the UN himself, that many aspects of the SDGs are up for discussion in light of radically changed circumstances, which include, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and also other um, things happening in the world, which mean that simply fulfilling the commitments made in 2015 might not be enough, first point. And second point, even if the formal redrafting of a new framework for sustainable and inclusive development post-2030 comes later in 2026, 2027, 2028, that doesn't mean that action now in the spirit of full inclusion of culture in the sustainable development goals and more broadly in the 2030 agenda isn't relevant and possible. With that in mind, uh, the document proposed a zero draft of what a culture goal could look like. And the goal was deliberately drafted in a very brief, open-ended way to encourage discussion and also to leave open the possibility that refinement and modification of the targets through discussion, consultation, and mobilization might lead to a different emphasis on certain keywords. The current goal in the zero draft states, ensure cultural sustainability 
for the well-being of all. Cultural sustainability obviously meaning both the sustainability of culture as a set of practices, including the cultural industries, the cultural institutions, but also um, a culture of sustainability. In other words, embedding the very idea of sustainability in webs of practices, meanings, uh, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that are, by definition, culturally constituted. Within uh, this overall goal, a number of possible targets were proposed. First, realizing cultural rights for all. Like the whole SDG agenda, the cultural agenda is a rights-based agenda, and there's a lot of work that's already been done in this area, including on specific indicators. Secondly, promote a culture of peace, nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity. Third, protect and safeguard all forms of heritage, which means establishing strong institutional connections between the existing heritage frameworks, managed in particular by UNESCO on the basis of the various relevant conventions, and uh, what a sustainable development goal would imply, just as conventions in other areas, the Convention on Biological Diversity or the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, are organically connected to the sustainable development goals um, in those two cases through uh, goals 14 and 13, respectively. Fourth, protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions to strengthen creativity, development, and so on. Uh, I'm not reading the full text. You'll find that in the document. I'm summarizing the key words. Again, this fourth target builds on an existing convention the Secretariat of which is ensured by UNESCO, the 2005 Convention on Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Indicators and um, technical protocols have been developed within that framework. They just need a more organic connection with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, fifth um, target, ensure that moves to develop sustainable tourism promote local culture and products. So that sustainable tourism is defined in terms of the needs and the desires and the vitality of the local communities it affects. Sixth, enhance the legal conditions and practical opportunities for mobility of cultural professionals. The emphasis on cultural professionals and the conditions of exercise runs through uh, many aspects of this proposed zero draft of a goal. Seventh, empower indigenous peoples to strengthen their own institutions, cultures, and languages, and to pursue their development in keeping with their own needs and aspirations. And eighth, though I'm not quite finished, um, develop a cultural approach in environmental protection and sustainable urbanization, ensuring the linkages with other goals, 11, 13, and 14 in particular, that I've already referred to because they're a particular professional interest to me as being among the key uh, interfaces to be emphasized. And then in addition to the targets numbered one to eight, following the uh, precedent of Sustainable Development Goal 16, which has both numbered targets and targets with letters, um, it was decided to add two lettered targets, A and B, which are the transversal targets that ensure the right kinds of connections between this potential goal and other goals. A um, is about strengthening cultural institutions to build capacity at all levels to realize cultural rights and sustain cultural pluralism. Something that uh, really um, depends on those lateral cross-cutting connections with other goals. And B, ensure through transversal multi-stakeholder collaboration that cultural considerations are taken into account in all international development goals. So that zero draft is the outcome of a consultation process, a lot of work done in 2022. Its purpose is to provide the basis for a broader discussion, including stakeholders throughout the culture sector in the broader sense, but also stakeholders beyond, to uh, build an understanding of what the world needs and of how it could be achieved. It is therefore an open-ended set of suggestions, which as its title implies, zero draft, 
is designed to evolve, be developed further, uh, and perhaps be significantly changed as a result of um, that consultative process. And certainly in this webinar, as in other events of a similar nature, um, we'll all be very pleased to listen to suggestions, criticisms, and comments on how this work could be taken forward, uh, looking to the Secretary General Summit in 2023 and the Summit of the Future uh, in 2024 as moments when these issues will be significant on the international agenda. Thank you very much. I look forward to this to the discussion. Thank you very much, John, for setting out the arguments there so so powerfully. I, I've been busily putting stuff up on Twitter trying to summarise things. So I, I, I always I don't know it it. it I mean, it's fantastic, especially even from someone who was involved back at the original stage and actually looking back, understanding what happened. But I think really there's that crucial point in there that we don't need to wait for 2030 in order to change. And indeed, we can't wait for 2030. And so you've talked a bit about the zero draft of the culture goal. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But certainly it's in the name. It's a zero draft. We really look forward to sharing further opportunities to actually dig into it to explore what could be changed, what could be updated, what could be turned on its head. The idea is, of course, that if people are to own it, to work with it, then then we need to, people need to be able to feed in. Clearly, of course, it already does benefit from survey work across the cultural field and across the development field. So hopefully not too much change needed, but we'll talk more about that shortly. Um, another point that you made was that a, a crucial thing right now is not simply to focus on the very limited interactions that exist within the SDGs at the moment. There's a quite a narrow reference to, 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 to culture with their under goal 4.7. There's a narrowish reference to safeguarding heritage, natural and cultural. There's a narrowish reference to cultural tourism. However, the links go much further than that. And so on that note, I'm very happy to hand over to Jordi at uh, UCLG's Culture Committee, who has been leading some really fascinating work to look at that, that broader range of interlinkages and why we need to make those broader connections. I hope that's a good segue for you, Jordi. Thank you very much, Stephen. This is very generous. My gratitude to you, personal, because this side event is taking place because of uh, your uh, decision and, and success, and also gratitude of UCLG and all the campaign to the team in charge of the high, of the high level political forum side events. We love you. Thank you very much for allowing us this space. Uh, it is very important that we discuss the missing goal. Um, I will devote uh, the time I have, not even 10 minutes, to explain uh, four areas. One, why culture is so important to understand sustainable development. Second, a few elements of our work. Third, the article today we are publishing, we are, we are releasing on SDG 11 and uh, four reasons why a culture goal is a great idea. Let me go first to the basics. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible to understand sustainable development unless we include the cultural dimension. If we stick to what sustainable development is or to what the social and ecological transitions are, they place our sons, our daughters, our uh, children, the future generations at the center and they cannot survive, they will not be able, able to widen their freedoms to, to have human development unless they have the cultural capabilities in the areas of heritage, memory, creativity, diversity, knowledge, rituality, trust, that strong, solid, close contact with cultural experiences and practices bring impossible to be a complete uh, developer of uh, humanity unless culture is not explicit and operational. We in 2012, in 2013, in UCLG, 
we were worried about the, at that time, Millennium Development Goals. We went to the UNESCO Conference of Hangzhou in 2013, May, with a clear proposal, we need a culture goal. That proposal, as you all know, as uh, John, as Stephen have explained, wasn't a success. We anyway, we wrote a thin document in September 2013, the first document of the culture 2015 goal campaign at that time. And, and we wrote it knowing that there would not be a culture goal, but we wrote it for our uh, children and grandchildren. Having failed, and, and we knew that that proposal was going to, to fail, in UCLG, we had to serve our membership. Cities, regions, local governments all around the world, implementing, localizing sustainability, sustainable development, impossible to localize, to implement, to achieve sustainability, uh, sustainable development, unless culture is explicit and operational. So we did three things. First, we wrote a guide. This guide you can find in our website. Second, we indexed all our good practices according to the SDGs so that everybody can put find SDG four, what cities are doing in culture, this number of good practices, etc. And we invented a new program, the seven keys, seven local keys that a city commits to uh, unfold to localize the SDGs with a cultural perspective. So this is what we, we did. And of course, of, of course, uh, we uh, were in September 2018 when the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign was re-energized. We are totally convinced of the importance of this campaign. Let me go to the to the most recent work that we are doing in UCLG. Uh, today, at the local and regional governments forum, and tomorrow, at the local and regional governments day in the high level political forum, UCLG is going to release the localization report. With these five chapters, you have the slide now in your screens. A chapter on right to adequate housing, a chapter on feminist accessible and participatory urban planning, a chapter on climate action and climate justice, a chapter on culture as a pillar of sustainable development, and a chapter on multi-level multi -level governments and balanced urban systems. In the culture chapter, a cultural booth in the achievement of the SDGs, we have, we have been bold we have designed this, this figure. You can see the 17 goals and in gray, in, in green shadow, you see statements, policies, actions that cities are already uh, implementing or cultural actors or urban actors, social actors are implementing. But you also see here below the logos, in red, difficult areas, areas in which today's cultural practices, cultural policies, cultural actions go against the achievement of the SDGs. Let me give an example, three examples. And we marked the more than 140 policies, actions from minus three to plus three. So an example of minus three, cultural narratives and practices that go against human rights and legitimize the violation of the rights of women, girls, and all people for their sexual orientation or gender identity. This is happening in uh, several places, unfortunately. An example of plus three, culture and heritage integrated in urban planning contribute to quality of life, as well as to the uniqueness of each city, championing local identity and promoting its dynamic character. Or an example of plus one, regular monitoring of the 
active relationship of the relationship among active cultural practices, personal well-being, and health. We have tried to offer to our members uh, priorities, areas in which the inclusion of cultural actors, of cultural policies, of cultural act uh, actions can uh, promote, can uh, accelerate the achievement of SDGs goals and targets, but also policies, actions, programs, narratives that are felt as cultural and that need to be rethought because their existence go against the spirit and the uh, feasibility of the achievement of SDGs goals and targets. I conclude, we believe that the, the cultural goal zero draft that we released in September 2022, uh, very well explained by, by John, is an excellent idea. It goes in the direction of what the Secretary General of the United Nations wrote in May this year in his rescue plan to achieve the SDGs. He says the cultural dimension is underutilized for the achievement of the SDGs. We need a boost in the use of culture to achieve, to localize, to implement the SDGs. So we believe that this debate is going in this direction. We also believe it is essential that the SDG summit in September, 2023 mentions that culture is underused and that culture is a boost in the achievement of the SDGs now. And we also believe that the summit of the future in September, 2024 is the perfect moment in which an in-depth analysis of the potential of culture in sustainability, in the eco-transitions, uh, we need to be ready, we need to be strong, we need to be convinced uh, that culture needs to be integrated in that summit of the, of the future. Three key elements and I conclude. First, uh, this is homework. Uh, first, we need more ownership of this campaign in uh, cultural organizations, institutions, actors, sectors. Second, we need to convince other stakeholders, the feminist movement, the environmentalists, the fighters for social justice, that the existence of a culture goal would be beneficial for their causes too. And third, we need to refine our uh, science-based uh, approach. We need to use all the scientific evidences that exist in the scientific community that affirm, demonstrate that nothing can be done without the power of culture. Nothing related to human development, nothing develop, uh, related, nothing related to uh, building our common future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jordi. I feel like I've, I've got homework now, so I've been noticing, <laughs> noting this all down, but I think we're definitely looking forward to, 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 to the work that comes out and hopefully it'll be possible to share a link, uh, I think certainly on, on the Culture 2030 Goal website, um, which we've already linked to a couple of times, we will be, we'll be highlighting this. Um, this research, I think you know, it, it's, I think what's powerful about it is work that has already been carried out for other goals, looking at the inter interconnections between them and the complementarities or potential um, potential for, for shocks, for, for you know, potholes and issues that we can avoid if we actually think about things properly. And, and I think I know, it just builds up that case, it's echoing that point that John made earlier. Um, Obviously, one point, the first point that you made there was the importance even within the cultural sector to, to make sure that we are united and that we are all together making this case at the global level, at the national level, at the local level. Um, it is potentially one of the reasons why we don't have a culture goal at the moment was because we didn't succeed in, in, in this so strongly. And um, certainly the signs are positive at the moment. The fact that even th th this evening um, at, well, this evening in New York time at, 
At 6.30, there's also an event organized by the government of Greece alongside UNESCO focusing on the cultural goal. This is definitely a positive sign. Um, However, as I said, a lot of the hard work and we can't just rely on UNESCO and cultural ministries to do this. As John said, this is too important an issue. This is too cross cutting an issue just to be left to organizations with culture in their names. Um, and so what we need to do is to mobilize. And so what I want to do in the next couple, the next couple of interventions is therefore to hear from people within the sector about what this will mean actually from the perspective of, of these cultural actors, these cultural sectors, what the impact of a goal be in order to build that understanding, in order to build that ownership. So on that basis, I would like therefore to hand over to Brittany at ICOMOS. And thank you for joining us at what is now gone 11 o'clock at night, your time. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Stephen. Um, thank you for your kind introduction earlier. I just want to note that I have actually changed position since that bio got put in. Um, I'm now working as a policy officer for the Australian government, looking at federal and state government interactions with um, industry and Indigenous groups, stakeholders in um, certain areas of the country. Um, so I think it's even with that, it's even more important that we have these discussions because it impacts on everyone. So the importance of culture and heritage to global sustainable development has been well litigated and it's we've just heard from John and Jordi about this topic. Um, so tonight I'm going to approach just from a slightly different direction and want to discuss what the lack of culture goal has meant for the heritage sector and then try to envision what it would mean for us to have one. So at the moment our only sort of coverage in the SDGs as we probably all know is through 11.4 which doesn't really fully um, cover the scope of heritage um, and it doesn't allow it to be examined, supported and utilised for sustainable development in a truly holistic and intersectional manner that it should be. By including a cultural goal in the future with heritage, it will allow heritage to be a true part of that subset and will be able to strengthen not just our sector but many others. By introducing a cultural goal in 2030 agenda, a more systematic an inclusive approach to restorative economic activities as proposed in the ICOMOS draft resolution 21, which is being tabled at our General Assembly at the end of the year, can be implemented. As it stands, the culture and heritage sector have been extremely adversely affected by not having a dedicated goal. Just through a very quick Google search and, a, you know, reading a couple of websites, I was easy able to find numerous funding mechanisms that are available to governments that are crafted around supporting the, um, the SDGs. While some of them can be tangentially linked to the cultural activities, such as the Green Climate Fund, which recognises the place of cultural activities in enhancing cultural resi climate resilience, or the Global Fund for Education, which supports inclusive and equitable education systems in developing countries, they're both still primarily focused on supporting, supporting other sectors. While the culture and heritage sector have recognized the intersectionality of all of these issues and the wider public has started to accept this need for in integrated ethical economic decision-making, this approach has not been accepted by most governments. However, to change this, we have to be able to show them why they should be supporting it initiatives such as the Culture 2030 campaign efforts and ECOMOS's resolutions. Um, there are intersectional and interdisciplinary partnerships and research projects that are happening now that would need, that would benefit of the goals that being a goal has to truly flourish. One such project that exemplifies the true interconnectivity of community, heritage, culture and health is a recent publication in the International Journal for Equity in Health. Found, which found that across 130 quantitative and qualitative research projects on the link between health outcomes and Indigenous language in Australia, New Zealand and the United States, a full two thirds of them had positive health, health outcomes when linked to Indigenous language use. Addi additionally, the negative health outcomes at 21% of the examined projects had at least one compounding stressor. And even in the two thirds positive outcome, many of them did have a link to so low socioeconomic status, which we all know has a link to poor health outcomes. And we still had a positive um, influence of in the use of indigenous languages. 
While this is one limited example, it can be used to extrapolate the wider good that increased efforts towards integrated cultural heritage in sustainable development through a cultural goal will have as a net positive outcome. Through like, research like this, it is possible to quantify the impact of culture on society beyond the current data, which is limited to a single indicator in the SDGs, which is per capita spending on culture. This, and this data is then what needs to be used and gathered to influence decision makers, as Geordie just pointed out. Additionally, UNESCO is advocating for the understanding that peace is more than the absence of war. It is the living together with our differences of sex, race, language, religion, and culture. This message will be further strengthened by the inclusion of a culture and heritage goal. Through maintaining links with people's own communities and cultures, such as the joint UNHCR and International Telecommunication Union project that was launched a few weeks ago to ensure that all major refugee camps have available and affordable connectivity, which then allows displaced people to maintain, the, maintain those vital connections to inter, intercultural projects, such as the Pestalozzi program at the Council of Europe runs, which offers training activities for educational professionals of the hundred of sorry, 150 of the 50 countries of the European Cultural Convention. This program also places intercultural understanding at the cult center of these activities. Combined, these two projects can reduce the amount of xenophobia and national push towards nationalism that we're currently seeing and shows that the, um, the impact that culture and heritage can have on a peace, more peaceful world. These are only a few examples of the programs that are working out there today that do not benefit from the support of being a true SDG indicator. From that, we can only imagine the increase in scope and reach that would be achieved by the inclusion of the proposed culture goals. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I think, you know, especially those examples from the experience of it in Indigenous communities and, and the difference between a, an approach, and then this isn't necessarily even thinking about typically understood cultural actors, but the importance of the, taking into account those cultural factors and the difference this makes in terms of people's lives is, is, is really powerful. And, and I don't know, even just the symbolism, the signal that a culture goal offers, the power that this can have. So thank you very much. I, I want, without further ado, then to hand over to Jorge in, in Brazil, Santa Catarina. Okay, there you go. So, and, and so to hear from you from this perspective of, of, of libraries, as another branch, as another example of cultural institution as part of the cultural sector. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Stephen, uh, it's a pleasure to speak about a little bit about uh, the missing goal from the perspective of libraries. And I, I have some notes uh, prepared by Febabi. Febabi is the Brazilian Federation of Library Associations, is a federation member of IFLA. I, I also member of IFLA since 2015 uh, in the uh, Management Library Association section and the Latin American Caribbean uh, division. So, uh, what would uh, culture mean for libraries? Uh, in the report, a, a culture goal is essential for our common future. We have five reasons uh, that are given for the need for a goal dedicated to culture. Among of them, we can see a, a common trait that aims to ensure the access to culture. Access here is the keyword. Um, libraries are spaces that since their inception have aimed to collect, process, and prepare information in most diverse media for preservation and access. Uh, more recently, it has gone beyond that. They are increasingly reaffirming themselves to become democratic, becoming spaces that are bridged between their communities and reliable information. Uh, culture is recognized as an important economic engine driving creativity, innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, and development of culture and creative sectors. Uh, in addition, it can play a key role in promoting inclusive and equitable education by providing a solid foundation for lifelong learning. Today, among, among the cultural institutions that promote all these libraries occupy a prominent space that goes beyond 
their collections. Here we are talking about people and connections in the spaces that are the libraries. During the pandemic, we have observed the, the reality of several countries through the press and have realized that cultural facilities and actors have been severely damaged. On the other hand, cultural production like films, books, music, theater was the escape wave for many people who were feeling alone, close to mental health problems and who found refuge in verses, paragraphs and scenes. Libraries were able to reach people's homes for digital reference services, expansion of their virtual libraries and even storytelling via phone took place. Not to mention health guidance services, the work of gathering and documenting so much material with its free access made available mobilization for collection of food, food and hygiene, hygiene eatings, vaccination centers, and other words, libraries take care of people's well-being. We have some examples for United States and here in Brazil, for example. Uh, cultural, culture promotes identity and belonging, the preservation of art, artistic and historical heritage diversity and intercultural dialogue, economic and creative development, education and learning, as well as well-being well -being and quality of life. Consider, consider all this in the dynamic spaces and concerning about their communities, there are their libraries, which cooperate with this list of activities. The campaign, uh, the cultural 2030 campaign is also an opportunity to bring together those who work in the cultural sector, professionals in the arts, cultural equipment, music, heritage, memory, needed to recognize themselves as important and essential, essential agents in building a better society with opportunities for all. Here in Febabi, we are working with them um, them that is libraries for a better word is is uh, near is close to work of uh, international federation of library associations uh, ifla we have some i have some other examples but uh, we had a, we have a round of questions now indeed yes uh, thank you <laughs> But no, but I, I think uh, th thank you also. I know it, it's. You know, <laughs> I think obviously a lot of the time it's nice not to have to think back to the pandemic. But I think actually that reminder was there, and I know that clearly over the past few years, um, we've I know everyone in the cultural sector has, has had alongside the, the communities they serve, the people they serve, faced huge tragedies. And, and, and difficulties and complexities in fulfilling their role, but the examples of how the sector has stepped up, how innovative and how responsive it has been in trying to allow not only people to deal with those complexities, those same tragedies in terms of building well-being and building well-being, building bu building better lives and societies, but also simply to I don't know to be innovative, thinking how they can make a difference elsewhere. That's been incredibly impressive. Um, we are going to go to some questions. What I did want to do is actually, um, we do have Ege Yildirim with us, who is a, a cultural practitioner in Turkey and, and is a long-standing, active, very active um, person within the campaign and and, uh, and a sort of fantastic and who's also carried out some of the, the really deep dive, the analytical work that the campaign has put out about the place of libraries in voluntary national reviews. And so just before going to questions, I wanted to give her the opportunity to, to respond and, and to provide any of her inputs on the back of the presentations we've already had. El Ege. I've been caught uh, off guard. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I didn't have anything prepared to say, but um, thanks for the opportunity and thanks to our speakers and um, for uh, Brittany at uh, my ECOMOS. I'm also from uh, the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Well, um, let me just... Um, reiterate what I wrote in the chat about interaction with our audience today or our at uh, fellow attendees today. Um, I think uh, there's, as Greta says, blah, 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 is always more um, than um, 
perhaps called for in, in relative to the action that should follow the, the words. And uh, it's always good to start as soon as possible. And let's start today. And um, I think everyone listening in today um, critically would be you know, going over in their heads, how can this relate to my work? Um, and it's important to amplify our voices. And the, the campaign um, essentially has a core team, but um, uh, we always discuss how to expand the network. Um, and everybody here is an agent and you have your own networks and I'm sure they're diverse and eclectic and just taking the culture message and see how they can be contributing to this connectivity and you know the holistic view, I think uh, it's important. So I would just encourage people to actually comment more today or later. We've given our contacts, um, um, our uh, contact info, I think. Um, so um, I think that's what really I should say at this point, um, if, un unless you have anything you want me to say specifically, Stephen. That, 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 that's right, I, I think that that point about getting people more involved, and I've seen already some talk in the chat about how to get involved. So what we'll do now in the last 20 minutes is go to some of the questions, and Ege, you should of course ju jump in as well, but I did want to share before we go on, I've mentioned a little bit about this, and I, I'm, I apologize, I'm showing you the back end of an Excel file here. Um, but as said, one of the issues we faced is that while there isn't, and it's as long as there isn't a, a culture goal, we're forced to see quite an uneven approach to culture. And of course, there are those governments, those ministries, those departments, those agencies that, that, that get the message. Um, what we will be doing is producing, is publishing some analysis, not all of the voluntary national reviews for this year have been published, but of the ones, I think about 32, 33 have come out. We've done some initial analysis of how culture is featuring and the different perspectives that are being taken, not only about culture as a goal in itself, but to which uh, to, to, to what extent actually culture is being seen more broadly, is being adopted, is being integrated as, as, as a key feature, as, as a way of achieving success across the board. So you can see in particular, I think I said, this focus, this idea that culture needs to be seen as a pillar of sustainable development we have over here, and um, that's about two, about a third of voluntary national views published so far do make this connection, and um, which certainly was extremely valuable. We see about half over here that culture is being seen, that taking account of those cultural factors, those examples that Brittany offered, is a way of actually enabling progress, of delivering more effective, more responsive policy. So we're seeing that being accepted in about 50% of cases. We see different connections being made across the board, so connections with education, with environmental action, about a third are, are underlining that we need to think about culture if we're going to deliver environmentally. We have points about well-being, about employment, about economic growth, about broader identity. How do you create the social capital, the functions needed in order to actually, as a social capital, the actions, the momentum, the ability to deliver that's necessary in order to do this. And there's some great examples. I think we can look, and Portugal is fantastic on this. Chile's review is extremely good. There's some really good work in the Canadian voluntary national review, focused on the importance of culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate policy approaches in order to deliver. So I think over the next week or so, we'll see some really good presentations that highlight this role. Obviously, we hope that people will pick up on them spontaneously, that the other governments will do so. That's not guaranteed. We can only really address this with this strong assertion, this strong confirmation that culture is indeed, that culture should be treated as a goal in the SDG summit, um, in, in the SDG summit, in, in the summit of the future. So in, in terms of the questions that I wanted to ask, and, and of course I've, I've shared these with the panelists in advance, but I suppose what would be help, what would be great first of all is to share any suggestions you have about what particularly positive examples have you come across? I've mentioned some of the voluntary national reviews. Um, I might ask John, first of all, if you have any particularly strong positive examples you might want to share. Sorry, uh, is, yeah, sound is on, but I just need to put the camera back. <laughs> um, well, <sighs> This is actually um, challenging. Uh, in in another context, I'm working with UNESCO on the parallel agenda of culture as a global public good, coming from the uh, Montier Cult Outcome document as well. And one of the challenges we're facing is to 
try to collect um, information about practices that do actually correspond to that vision uh, of uh, culture as a global public good. Now, I know it's not exactly the same agenda. It's different institutionally. It has some different dynamics. But at a very general level, it, it's actually very similar. Um, global public good is another way of saying should be at the heart of the sustainable development agenda. Um, it's not exactly coterminous, but it's uh, it's um, pretty close. And my my impression is that while we have lots of good micro examples of things done, for instance, at city level, many of them in connection with the excellent work of uh, UCLG. So probably uh, uh, Jordi is better placed to comment than me. Um, it's much harder to find macro examples uh, of things actually being integrated cross-sectorally, cross-territorially, and taken up even to a national level. I think that's the that's the real challenge. So um, as we take note of and indeed celebrate good examples uh, at reasonably small geographical scale, we have to keep in mind that um, they don't necessarily add up to the kind of big picture we need. And I would add a further methodological point on that, which is that the issue isn't always to scale up things that work at micro level, because not everything desirable scales up. Um, scaling is often taken in a very um, simplistic way as taking something small and making it bigger, like a scale model, turn the ant into an elephant. Um, but turning ants into elephants doesn't necessarily produce very uh, useful ants, and it arguably it may not be elephants that we need. So the question is less uh, scaling up in that rather mechanistic sense than finding ways of learning from micro successes in ways that can create the conditions, the collective learning and um, um, implementation conditions for macro successes. That's a very long-winded way of saying, no, I don't have any great examples to offer. But I hope the uh, the the negative response was useful, at least methodologically. I think, well, given that I'm going to hand over to Geordie now, I'm sure it's a very good way of leading in there. But I, I think that point about it's not just a case of trying to take a single project and, I don't know, zoom it, I don't know, expand a hundred times. And, and as you say, However, it's that question of how what is the approach that's needed? What's the fundamental what are the fundamental ideas and philosophies that can be maybe more easily transplanted or more easily adapted at different levels? Um, Geordie. Three examples. Um, I'll be brief, but let me give these three examples. Uh, a very important French city in the last one year has been working to write with uh, its communities, with uh, all urban and metropolitan stakeholders. Uh, they have been working in the long-term development plan of the metropolis. And one of the conclusions of that plan is we need a cultural goal. And they write to us, uh, they say, they ask, what have you done in this matter? Well, we, we make sure that they uh, have all our documents, UCLG and Culture 2030 Goal campaign. Uh, this is an example of uh, that spontaneously, when something appears all over the world with people disconnected, uh, it means that there's something in the air. It means that uh, this, is, this is coming. Second example is the work you have been doing, Stephen, in uh, IFLA, in the analysis of the, of the voluntary uh, national reviews. Uh, the results you have achieved, the, 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 the wording on culture and uh, other policy domains in the VNRs 2023, or the work of the cities in the VLRs and the, uh, v, uh, and the subnational uh, reviews too, that was not foreseen in 2016, 2017. It's totally unexpected. It was totally unexpected in 2016, 2017 to have those 
very good examples that we have today. So, and it, it, it links with something that we always discuss with the, with the team in the culture team in UCLG with uh, Marta, Sarah, Agnes, Antoine. Um, we cannot be tired of repeating the same arguments uh, day after day, week after week, year after year. Because when a narrative uh, needs to be uh, well discussed, and when we are convinced that uh, a, a, a great range of actors are going in the same direction, we have to carry on the empowerment. We have to carry on insisting. We have to find new arguments, yes. We have to involve more people, yes. We have to be more uh, science-based, yes. But uh, we have to carry on with uh, insisting the same message, the same narrative, and hear the message, culture goal, no sustainability without a cultural dimension. This is too strong to, to not, not to carry on, not to insist. Let me give final example, because this is UCLG Culture Summit in Dublin on uh, 28th, 29th, 30th of November. We will make noise on the culture goal. Uh, please come to Dublin. You will be involved in in-depth discussions on how cultural rights are implemented at a local level and how the international community wants a cultural goal. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it, I, I know I'm sort of really looking forward to that as an opportunity to, to have some of that learning, but also to really crucially to, to make that link between what's going on. And, and hopefully, I think also just, just picking up on, on one of the suggestions that you made, Geordie, that mobilizing that broader community and making sure that it can it's not just culture people asking for culture but it's the broader everyone who's involved in sustainable development which is basically everyone sees this value sees this values this promotes this thank you over to you Brittany so it's actually it's a bit of a tangent from what John was saying in that not you know you can't take a mi micro example and necessarily blow it up to a macro example. I've got a macro example that sort of worked in one way and has produced some pretty interesting innovation in another um, because basically in about 2010, the Australian government put out their first national curriculum. And as part of that initiative, they, in, they required that every, um, every subject had to, ha have, had to have some level of Indigenous Australian and Torres Strait Islander education or knowledge braided into that curriculum. So for things like history, geography, that's pretty easy to do, even for English and other languages. But once you, the science and technology teachers really struggled with that, they're sort of like, how are we meant to approach this? How are we meant to do this in an organic way that isn't just going, well, we're going to talk about the flora and fauna or biology of Australia and then move on and sort of lose that in other sectors of their teaching. And what they've ended up doing is they've actually not approached it in terms of this is what the science of the na native Indigenous Australians are. Instead, they've gone, how, how do they teach their knowledge? They're, they're a very long-standing in um, oral tradition. How did they maintain that very detailed geographic um, and celestial and all other knowledge through very deep time and they've actually used that learning model in their class curriculums instead so it's a way of approaching how they integrate that culture in a different way that it's taken them a while to get there but I think that innovation um, is only possible a little bit when it's shoved down your throat when you sort of go you have to do this so you've got a way to find a way to make it work and the only way we as a, as a sector is going to happen is when we do have that broader support. And I think with what Geordie is saying is that there is that wider support for that now. And we are starting to see that. But that's an example of at a macro level how it can then drive innovation. Thank you. And, and I think I found this particularly interesting as well, because I think, and, and again, this comes from the work we've done looking through voluntary national reviews, we can both treat culture as a goal in itself, which I think is, is, is clearly valuable and cultural rights are human rights and they need to be upheld and, and guaranteed for everyone. But actually there's something deeper than that. I think it, it, it's, a, it's not just 
traditionally narrowly defined culture that we're looking for. It's also broader cultural approaches. And so that idea of how do you actually integrate that into how you teach rather than purely point at something and say, hey, that's culture and that's good. That, that's quite a powerful and interesting example. And, and, and I think this, this approach, this focus on approaches and factors rather than a more narrow definition is, is it's something that we're looking to do. And, and of course, I know, nonetheless, this means that bringing in cultural actors into that policy process, into the process of actually defining, designing what we're doing is so important. Um, Jorge, over to you. Okay, um, here in Brazil, after 2017, 2018, after the largest, largest Library Science Congress, uh, Fabi carried out a mapping and publishing the first version of the Libraries for the Better World book, uh, and in which it presents several projects throughout Brazil aligned with the SDGs. In this book, we have uh, 40, 42 projects from libraries. Uh, we have, in the one of the examples, we have USP libraries. USP is the University of Sao Paulo that create a publication with qualified and accessible information for rural producers. Uh, we have another university, University of Paraíba, uh, that uh, where we have extension project to, pro to promote the qualification and of community libraries respons responsible for carry out cultural activities in neighborhoods of Sir João Pessoa. João Pessoa is the city of Paraíba. Uh, in a global context, we can mention the examples that have been mapped by the library, uh, by the IFLA library map of the world. We have the example of Netherlands with the book start projects that works with early childhood, with the first con contact with books at, and local culture. In Ukraine, that there is a, also a similar example uh, the project is call, called the Libraries Fairy Tale uh, that emphasizes the importance of the developing literacy and interpersonal skills, such as empathy and mor morality. Uh, we have seen amazing things happening in different parts of the world, in the case of here in Latin America and Caribbean, especially in Brazil during the pandemic, libraries become spaces for collecting food. Hygiene eating, support for receiving gov government grants, listening places for those who sell, sold their friends and family dying during the pandemic. Uh, this is some examples in Brazil and global level. Thank you very much, and, and I, I will make sure that we, we share the link to that. I think well, I think I found the link to that, which we'll share in the chat because. I think again, I suppose it, to some extent it's normal, I don't know, we're talking about a culture, a, a sector that's based on the importance of creativity. And so of course it's a logical place to look for creative approaches to how do we resolve problems that we face, the challenges that we face. I said, Georgia, oh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing the links there. And also do share the one to the Feb Abbey publication. So I'm, I suppose I, I'm conscious that we're coming up to time and I'm conscious and I, I want to respect everyone's time, especially, those of you who are in New York and, and want to get there in time for 10 o'clock sessions and, and don't want to end up too sweaty, although given it's New York in the summertime, that's kind of inevitable. Um, so actually what I will ask is, is if each of you are able actually to give just in one sentence, the recommendation that you would give, what do you think that the, the governments and the stakeholders meeting at the moment in New York and online, what can they do to actually move towards this more effective, this more meaningful, integration, recognition of culture in their efforts to, to, to implement sustainable development goals. So first over to you, jo uh, John. Thanks. Um, I think if there's just one thing, it's something several of us have mentioned, in, including uh, you, Stephen. Don't, don't wait for post-2030. Don't wait for a revision of the existing framework. The framework is an enabling framework of the SDGs. It doesn't limit what you can do. If you want to do something that's not in it, but is in its spirit and contributes to it, go ahead and do it. Develop your own indicators. Don't wait for the mechanics. Don't hide behind the process. Fantastic. Excellent message. Thank you. Jordi. 
Yes, same, same statement. Um, <laughs> adapted to our realities of United States and, and, and local governments. In 2004, we wrote and adopted Agenda 21 for Culture. In 2015, we approved Culture 21 actions, 100 actions on cultural rights at the local level. And we are drafting the third frame document to be approved in 2025. Uh, a guide, the 21 plus, with around 200 actions, uh, a human rights-based compendium on local, po local policies for, for culture. This is already available. We are happy to co-create this, this uh, toolkit, this compendium with cities and local governments all around the world. And it is, we believe, a very clear incarnation on how a culture goal can be unfolded locally. So yes. Uh, totally in agreement with what what john has said thank you thank you so yeah <laughs> we should be acting now and there's there's very little reason not to the tools are in place the mm. structures are in place the guidance is in place to actually do it um Brittany, over to you i think rather than repeat what's already been said which i agree with it's mm. i think another important point is to broaden your understanding of what culture and heritage is. It's not just old buildings and, you know, people in traditional clothing. It's a lot more than that. And to really understand the impact that it has and it could potentially have, you need to actually understand the breadth of the field as well. Thank you. I think that, that that's a powerful one. I think it's, it's a point that you've made very much that, that we're looking beyond, I know, we talk about cultural actors and factors which works nicely in English, obviously, I think French as well. Um, but, but that point that, and that broader approach is, 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 is so crucial. And, and that I know if we try, if we go too narrow, we miss opportunities, we miss potential. Georges, over to you. So uh, from the libraries, I, I think we have uh, five points. Open and continuous dialogue with government. Uh, financial support and the resources for cultural groups, um, inclusion of cultural targets and indicators and sustain sustainable development plans, and in the last case, uh, the governments can invest in, investing in capacity building and education programs targeting cu cultural groups, promoting that development of skills, knowledge, and competencies in cultural areas. Here in Brazil, we have uh, this problem, and I believe that it is the same in other libraries from around the world. Thank you. And that's a really good, so powerful message that and that's something that exactly the governments can hopefully just they, they, they can already act on. I mean, it's a matter of choice, it's a matter of priorities they can work on. So thank you so much to, 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 to everyone, to John, to Jordi, to Brittany, to Jorge, to, yep. to, to, to Ego for your words there. Um, we're a little bit over time, so I will close now and I won't actually add anything because the points were really good. Um, what we will do is we will upload this video as quickly as possible, um, depending on the speed of the Wi-Fi and YouTube upload speeds. Um, and we'll also look to accompany this with a few links to some of the materials, some of the sources that we've talked about. Um, so those of you who are in New York, uh, do of course come along to the UNESCO session at half past six local time tonight. I think in the chat, someone's helpfully shared the link to where it will be live streamed as well. Um, and hopefully we can bring some of these messages along there and complement the work that UNESCO is really pushing forwards as well. Um, but um, with that, please also do keep a close eye on the Culture 2030 Goal website. We're really looking forward to sharing more about how you can get involved in in shaping, in, in commenting on, on improving the zero draft. Um, we're really looking forward to getting to a version one um, uh, towards the beginning of next year. Um, look out also for opportunities to get involved in really trying to put some pressure on governments to make sure that the SDG summit declaration this September, the summit of the future next September, properly include culture because I know this is the key opportunity. This is the key milestone we have right now. This is the opportunity to set down the marker that we're not just going to sleepwalk into the same mistakes as we made in 2015. Culture is there, it is recognized, it needs to be mobilized. So with that, thank you very much everyone for your time. Thanks to all those who've joined here today and um, have a very good high level political forum. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank Thanks. you for everyone. Thank you.